one of the things that I wanted to go over was the idea of coherence, which relates to at least one question, <laughs> relates to at least to this first two question here, which asks about why one two small lens held close together produce an interference pattern on a distant screen. And I think uh, um, because it was one of the OpenStax questions, they should have addressed this point about coherence that um, for Co or lack of coherence could be a potentially limiting factor in, um, in, in whether you can observe interference effect or not. Uh, let me see here, coherence, yeah. Yeah, so they do talk about coherence here. Um, and <laughs> so there's some information there. And uh, what I want you to do here is, uh, so, you know, you see the word description here. And I think the, Kind of the downside over here is that it, uh, well, um, I, I, I wanted to uh, give an uh, alternate presentation where if, you know, if this word uh, description about coherence or incoherence makes a sense, then great. <laughs> Good. Um, I guess what I'll do for the next five minutes or so, you don't really need it. Um, if uh, this didn't make immediate sense, then I want to kind of illustrate it. And this, by the way, also connects to something that you might have seen me talk about in one of the lecture videos. Uh, when we were dealing with the polarization and the nature of unpolarized light, I think in the lecture video, one of the, you know, this question came up as I was lecturing back in spring 2018. And, um, and you know, I gave the answer that I needed to give then. And, um, and as we are talking about interference, so that's where, so um, kind of the unpolarized, uh, light being unpolarized, that is one of the features of um, um, incoherent light because the, when a uh, light is unpolarized, the way it's unpolarized is uh, it, it each given kind of um, burst of light does have a given polarization, but it randomly shifts. And that random shift is what results in the things that you observe with unpolarized light. So uh, the demonstration that I thought would be useful for illustrating um, uh, circumstances where you get coherence. I, I thought um, laser simulation would be great for illustrating that because in fact, the coherence is a special feature of laser light. Most of the light sources in the world is not coherent. In fact, there are very little things we can do to make uh, natural light sources coherent. They come incoherent and they're just gonna remain incoherent. It's with the lasers where you can actually uh, produce coherent light. And it has to do with how laser operates. It's uh, uh, something that we uh, unfortunately won't take a lot of time on. I think your textbook does have a chapter on lasers that, or section on lasers. I recommend that you read it. Wait, does it not have anything on lasers? Oh, wait, wait, there it is, yeah, lasers. <laughs> so you can also talk about lasers when we talk about atomic structure, because uh, that's the place where we would be equipped to talk about how you get the light amplification. So I'm kind of um, jumping ahead to a topic that uh, uh, designated for later in the semester, in the like last third of this class. Yeah, so, so this is a simulation that what I want to show here is, um, let me start out with, uh, I think I can do this with the multiple atoms. So let me shine some light. And here you can kind of see um, what the uh, normal um, sources of light or normal natural non-laser sources of light look like. It's, uh, let me start the simulation, pause it. So you see um, these atoms or models of atoms emitting light. They emit light when they undergo transitions. You know, the incident light, it excites these atoms from level one to level three. And um, as they decay uh, down to level two, and as they decay from two to one, that's when they emit light. And this light that these atoms are emitting, they are random. They, um, so the, this light that one atom emits 
doesn't really have any relationship with the dislike that another atom emits. So this is where you get uh, randomly shifting phases and randomly shifting polarization. That's the source of incoherence. It's uh, things are things that are incoherent are incoherent because they have no relationship to each other. And so, they, um, so you wouldn't expect them to be related and they are not related. <laughs> and uh, even for the lights that are heading the mostly the same way, let me see if I can capture some of that. Uh, it's kind of hard to capture here. Let me see if uh, I can do that with a stronger light. So occasionally you might like, the, okay, these two uh, light particles, they're going mostly the same way, but they still have no relationship to do with each other. They are still, um, they are still not related to each other in terms of phase or in terms of polarization. That's the source of incoherence. That's uh, where you get things that are just randomly distributed. And, um, and when you have, um, things, when you have that incoherence, that uh, when um, you can see interference because the our ability to observe interference, it relies on there being a stable phase relationship that lasts for some uh, appreciable amount of time or length of light transmission. So that um, over, so because what we observe is always a time averaged quantity and we need those interference patterns not to be washed out in the time average. So now, laser is a special in that it can produce coherent light. And uh, you kind of see hint of that. I've been trying not to um, bring attention to it. This simulation is designed so that sometimes it shows these doubled uh, light particles. Um, and these two photons are, they are related to each other. They have the same phase, the same polarization. They are copies of each other. So, um, so laser is a device that's uh, designed to amplify situations like this. And so let me uh, set just to change this, this simulation so that it'll show the lasing condition. Um, to do that, I need a metastable state and I need a mirror to kind of trap them in for a bit. Um, Let's see, uh, it's been a while since I played with the simulation, so I don't know the exact parameters that will work. Let me give this a little bit of a try. Um, oh, wait, wait, I did this wrong. <laughs> Lifetime for two should be long to be metal stable. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, so. Um, I think I might need a better reflectivity. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, what you have here is what's called a population inversion uh, in thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. It's normal for lower energy levels to have a high, more number of um, higher population. Um, and in the laser setup, you invert the population with some either convenient arrangement or whatever, so that a state with a higher amount of energy actually has more um, population of atoms in that state. And when you have enough of this, you can get um, more of a, what's called a, a stimulated emission. So see if I can uh, capture that. Um, Okay, I think it's one of these two particles will hopefully hit either this or this atom before they decay, then you will see stimulated emission taking place. Um, yeah, so this is just the hit that too. Let me, see. and I think, uh, uh, did that just appear with that? No, I think that just uh, decayed on its own. Um, let me see if I can find the one there. I'm looking at this whole, that this will get stimulated emission. No, I don't really necessarily know the details of, okay, I'm just watching it, this one, seeing if this will get, uh, undergo stimulated emission by either one of these two. Um, no, 
Oh wait, oh, there it is. Yeah, when that one photon hit this, it uh, went down to level one and it, there were these two additional photons that came up. That's the phenomenon of a stimulated emission. And when that happens, that's when you get light amplification. That's the LA of later. And um, so the special feature here is that these two photons have the same uh, characteristics, same phase, phase, same polarization, same everything. So in a, in a laser, you, you, um, you end up with a buildup with uh, light. That's uh, uh, basically um, light that's uh, copies of each other. So that's where you can get coherence. These uh, light that's being emitted out here, they have the they have a stable phase relationship. So the light that's coming out at about the same location, they will have the same phase. That light that's out here, the the phase difference from here to here will be predictable through the as a fraction of the wavelength. So. So, um, so that's why when you see me doing um, interference demos in the lecture, you will always see me doing that with the laser because um, it's just easier with the laser. And now you can do interference demos with uh, normal sources of light. People have been doing uh, interference experiments well before lasers were invented. But what they had to do to make sure it was, they had to make sure that their experimental setup was um, within the coherence length of the light source that, you're, that they were using. Um, usually the, the longer lived states and uh, narrower lines, they, they are associated with the longer coherence length. So, um, so with those, you can do interference experiments with the sodium lens. You just have to uh, take some uh, precautions. Uh, take measures to ensure that um, that the kind of the experiment you are trying to set up is within the uh, coherence limit of your light source. So, as an example, uh, let me get rid of this. Uh, as an example, that's where. Um, so that's why when we see when when we uh, present the double slit interference, we present it this way. It's a single slit here. Um, Young needed that in order to make sure that his light source from this point on is more or less coherent. Because it's a, such a small slit, it only lets a small portion of the light through so that you can, he could rely on some kind of a coherence relationship between light that's arriving here and here. So when we use the lasers that, um, avoids the need for this single slit because when we have a coherent light to start with, then we can just uh, have that and have it go through a double slit. Um, so yeah, so uh, um, and, and I hope that makes sense. And you know, and, you know your textbook kind of describes it and, um, and yeah, so the S not is also to be point source of monochromatic light, and um, it being both a point source and monochromatic uh, makes it so that um, these two have a, some coherence relationship. And um, 